people sometimes feel like it's not worth it. I mean, three breaths. In the beginning, it seems like you're here maybe 2% of the time. But if you look honestly, now coming upon five or six days from the start of the retreat, you might be here instead of 2% of the time, 4%. You're still spaced out, gone 96%, right? Now, in one way, that's kind of discouraging statistically, that 96%. But in another way, what it says is you are now here, alive, present, twice as much as you were a few days ago, which is not a small thing. Hey there, and welcome to Jack Cornfield's podcast, Heart Wisdom, on the Be Here Now Network. I am Ganesh, Jack's assistant, honored to open the door for you to episode 225, Letting Life Breathe. This episode originally took place at the Insight Meditation Society on October 9th of 1983 and was labeled as deepening levels of practice. This sounded a bit dry to me, but I dove in and I'm really glad that I did. More than even the levels of practice, the shining gold of this episode really comes down to making practice feel alive. He describes practice as the feeling of how life is pulsing, moving, flowing, rhythmically within our body and our experience, the actuality of how life is happening in, through, and around us. And meeting it with a kind of presence and refining that presence in our attention like a goldsmith allows us to get to a point where we can let life breathe. Chogim Champa Rinpoche described real spirituality as fresh baked bread. And if we are with the rhythms of what is going on around us and what's going on inside of us, we are in the moment of fresh baked bread. If we notice that we're bored, like I did so much this week, just in my had a lot to do, but was just bored with the rhythms. But after hearing this episode and really sitting with it, I recognized the rhythms are dynamic and they are beautiful. Whether it's the rhythm of the week or the rhythm of the sound outside, if you live in the city, the the honking or the the. Uh, the foot traffic, or whether it's the wonderful, sweet rhythm of your breath going in and out from your nostrils. These rhythms are ever present and they are always there as sweet, subtle, gentle reminders to bring us back home. So, we have a little housekeeping before diving into the episode. This February 19th, Jack will be back for his Spirit Rock Monday Night Dharma Talk. This is Pay What You Can and online with Zoom. So we hope you'll join us in Sangha there. Then on February 21st, Jack will be part of the Living a Joyful Life Summit. This will include teachers like Trudy Goodman, Robert Thurman, Mingyur Rinpoche, Byron Katie, and many more. This is going on from February 21st through 25th, and will be online. And then on February 21st as well, earlier in the day, Jack is going to be joining his old friend and another Be Here Now Network podcaster, Sharon Salzberg, for a fireside chat online presented by IMS Online. And IMS is actually exactly the place that this episode 
took place back in 1983. So with that, I wish you well. Thank you for joining us here on Heart Wisdom. May you be healthy. May you be content with life. May you help others through the authenticity of your own being. And may your heart be smiling. Namaste. Many of the Buddhist texts begin with this phrase that I mentioned in the first evening's talk. O nobly born, O you who are the sons and daughters of the Buddhas, remember who you really are. The Blessed One, as he's called in certain translations, goes on. My friends, there are large impurities in gold, such as earth, sand, gravel, and grit. Now the skilled goldsmith first pours the gold into a trough and washes, rinses, and cleans it thoroughly. And when the goldsmith has done this, there still remain moderate impurities in the gold, such as grit and coarse sand. So the goldsmith rinses and cleans it again. And when the goldsmith has done this, there still remain minute impurities in the gold, such as the finest sand and dust. And now the goldsmith repeats the washing, and thereafter only the gold dust remains. The goldsmith now pours the gold into the melting pot and smelts it, melts it together. But the gold is not yet quite pliant, workable, and bright. It is still brittle and does not yet lend itself to molding. So from time to time, the goldsmith blows on it. And from time to time, the goldsmith sprinkles water upon it. And from time to time, the goldsmith examines it closely. If the goldsmith were to blow on the gold continuously, it might be heated too much. If the goldsmith sprinkled water on it too much continuously, it would be too cool. And if the goldsmith were only to examine it closely, the gold would not come to perfect refinement. But if, from time to time, as called for, the goldsmith attends to each of these three functions, the gold becomes pliant, workable and bright, can easily easily be molded, and whatever ornament the goldsmith wishes to make, a crown, an earring, a necklace, a golden chain, can be used now for such a purpose. Similarly, as we pay attention, there are three qualities which a devoted practitioner should, from time to time, balance. Concentration, effort, and equanimity. And if one gives regular attention to the quality of concentration, to that of energetic effort, and to equanimity, gradually one's heart and mind will become pliant, workable, lucid, not unwieldy, and the gold of the heart and mind will shine. So this is one of the famous metaphors from ancient times about the process that we undertake and retreat. The first step of this process to go through it again in another language is simply the quality of presence, like the goldsmith coming and examining what there is to work with. And we bring our presence through our attention, as the attention might be to the gold, we bring our attention to the breath, this bellows of the body that moves. How to feel the breath? The invitation is to rest in the body, an embodied presence on this earth. As Eugene spoke of listening to the Dharma talk, with 100% of attention in the body and then hearing the words. 
we can rest in the body and feel how the breath comes and goes on its own. Now, sometimes that will be three breaths and then we're gone, or four breaths if we're lucky certain sittings, sometimes only two. And then you take the puppy when you notice it's gone away and it might have gone a pretty far distance, might even have peed on the carpet or something, you clean it up a little bit. You pick the puppy up, you don't beat the puppy. The puppy doesn't like it very much and neither do you. You bring the puppy back, stay, stay again. Two more breaths, three breaths off the puppy goes. People sometimes feel like it's not worth it. I mean, three breaths. In the beginning, it seems like you're here maybe 2% of the time. But if you look honestly, now coming upon five or six days from the start of the retreat, you might be here instead of 2% of the time, 4%. You're still spaced out, gone 96%, right? Now, in one way, that's kind of discouraging statistically, (laughs) not 96%. But in another way, what it says is you are now here, alive, present, twice as much as you were a few days ago, which is not a small thing. So we bring the puppy back. And gradually with it, we begin to use or ride the breath. Oh, my little breath, row me across the wide waters. We begin to feel the rhythm of the breath sometimes just half a breath at a time, just the beginning of it. You feel the breath and you rub your attention on the breath and just notice touching it. What does this breath feel like, this particular one? Someone came to an interview and said, I'm beginning to feel the breaths as they come in and go out, three, four, five, more breaths sometimes. But what happens, I notice, I feel it come in, And then it turns around, I feel it go out, and then there's a little gap, space before the next breath comes. And I space out in the space, and then I'm gone. I lose the breath, I lose presence. So this is a time when some people find a touch point helpful. The breath comes in, feel its rhythm for just half a breath or one breath, beginning, middle, end, coolness, swirling, breath goes out. And if there's a gap, you don't want to make it, but if there is, then you can feel your lips touching together. Or if you're feeling the rise and fall of chest or belly, your hands touching. Just present here until the next breath comes of itself. What we're doing is feeling the actuality of how life is pulsing and moving and flowing and swirling fast and slow, rhythmically, within our own body, within our own direct experience. And returning back to it over and over, there's a kind of refinement that takes place in doing so. There's also a care that's necessary. It gets kind of boring after a while. I mean, face it, breath, not a lot is happening. One teacher I had, Burmese teacher, asked us on long retreats every time we came in to tell him something new about the breath. 50 interviews, 50 things to find about the breath. Or my friend whose child was born, breech birth, turned blue, didn't breathe. Out in the country, no oxygen giving this infant artificial respiration. Finally, he started to breathe, her son. She was so happy and relieved. She said, that's when I learned what it was like to really listen for the breath, and it wasn't even my own, just to feel, was that breath going to be there, that tiny little breath? And if you think it's boring, I was looking in the Guinness Book of World Records today, one of the records I noticed that Eddie Levin and Delphina Krita, both 26 years old of Chicago, Illinois, set for the Guinness Book of Records, 
in 17 days and 10 and a half hours in September 24th, 1989, was the longest kiss ever. <laughs> 17 days, 10 and a half hours. <laughs> if Eddie and Delphina can do it, <laughs> we can do it. But it is a kind of deep process that we bring ourselves back to over and over. Listen to this. If you know what it means to be out in the middle of an ocean by yourself, in the dark, scared, then it gives you a feel for what every other human being is going through. I row an actual ocean. Other people have just as many obstacles to go through. This is from Toni Murden, the first woman to row solo across the Atlantic Ocean. One row at a time. So we're just coming back one breath at a time to bring the mind and body together, to re-inhabit this quality of presence of life with care. And there's a healing that takes place. The Buddha talks about feeling the breath until the breath begins to calm in the body until the breath brings a sense of openness or joy. It doesn't mean controlling the breath. One old Tibetan hermit who'd spent years and years in the cave and he came out and a Western monk, a friend of mine, got to meet this hermit just as he came out of the cave where he'd lived for all these years and said, what practice do you do? And the hermit just looked at him, what do you mean, what practice do I do? He said, like, do you, do you follow the breath? Do you visualize something? And the hermit smiled and he said, it breathes itself. It all just breathes itself. So we come back and we feel how it breathes itself, the rhythm of life. And then as we continue this inhabitation, this refinement, like the goldsmith of the gold of our heart, our presence, with the breath, we come, as we spoke about, more deeply into the body. And in the body, there's pleasant sensations and there's the tensions and pains that we carry that begin revealed in themselves as we sit. And the effort is simply to be present and tender with this body. There's a kind of tenderness even when the goldsmith's there. Sometimes he sprinkles a little water on it. Sometimes he blows on it. And sometimes he just gives it his attention that care or tenderness that we give to name what arises, to allow it to be held in the space of caring attention. Now what you notice as you sit, when painful things come, here we're sitting and following our breath, and Eugene did that meditation on pain. If painful sensations come, we'll talk about pleasant in a moment, there's the pain, and if you look deeply at the pain inside it, is pinpricks or throbbing or heat or fire or needles. It's actually alive in there. It seems like it's solid, but it's not. But usually we don't go into it. Instead of that deeper level or the pain, around it we contract, so there's contraction, and then there's aversion to it. And then there's a story. How much longer will this be? How much more time do we have in the sitting? Can I stand this? You know that kind of stories. This is my, my shoulder that does this. You know, and it'll be the way this way for the rest of the retreat, and I shouldn't have signed up for this month, and we just go on and on and on, you know. And really all there is is some sensations, but then there's the contraction, the aversion, and the story. What we're learning to do is to let that all float in attention. It's not like any part of it is wrong, but to notice the contraction, the aversion, the story, the direct experience of the pain or the pleasure if that's what's there, of the, the joy and the openness and the grasping of it, if that arises. And to be with it just as it is. One of the most instructive moments in the retreat is when you're sitting, especially if there's discomfort, at the end of the sitting and you're waiting and waiting and all of a sudden the bell rings. 
And in that moment, you hear the bell, and then everything's fine. All that stuff you were struggling and wrestling with in your body or wherever it was, oh, it's so hard, I'll never make it. And then you hear the bell, and everything is fine. Now, why is that? Nothing has changed. You're in the same posture. The same experiences are there. What's the difference? You hear the bell. And you stop resisting what's so. You're just with it. Not trying to get it to be different. Not trying to get it to go away. You're just with it as it is. So there's this deep body opening, the unknotting of structures, the energy and fire that move through us, the softening, the tingles. And you begin to notice that the body has its rhythms. In fact, whatever comes is really simple. It's like it's knocking on the door asking our attention. Would you give me a little attention, please? like your children, please pay attention to me. It takes a kind of courage of the heart to be present for this incarnation in this world, human form halfway between heaven and earth, to really open to it, to, Ram Dass's phrase is to take the curriculum. We came here, we're in this realm, to actually honor it. We have all these ideas about meditation, some quicker way, rather than just the inhabiting of each moment, as the Buddha did, just this moment. A poem for you. This is from Alison Luderman, and it's from memory, so the lines are mostly correct. She, She writes, Don't tell anyone, but even as a good Jewish girl, I love Jesus. I love his dark, Semitic eyes, and how his friends are all the poor and the prostitutes, and how how he will even go to hell for love. He's just like that Buddhist bodhisattva of compassion, Avalokiteshvara, except his name is easier to pronounce. It's hard to yell for Avalokiteshvara when you're in big trouble. But, oh, Jesus comes quite naturally. I don't want to die saying, oh shit. I want to die like a llama, lying on my right side, turning my head in the direction of my next birth. I know I would have to meditate a lot to do this well, and let's face it, there aren't enough years left in my life to get that enlightened. And following Jesus seems so much easier. All you have to do is love everyone. Well, seems is the critical word here. Sometimes it seems impossible with all the people around you. You know what I mean. But then if you really look, you realize, what else is there to do? What else is there to do? So this practice of inhabiting, of opening, of becoming present, of tending like the goldsmith, takes a courage of the heart. It's not a quick fix. It's a returning over and over. But when we do, we begin to notice moments when the gold starts to shine. Those moments where we move from the small sense of self, from the body of fear, and the heart starts to feel even a moment, oh, free, oh, let go, oh, just present and open. And how wonderful that is to remember O nobly born, who we are. You'll notice when we give instructions that we don't tend to use the word see much anymore. In the beginning it used to be, you know, 25 years ago the translations were things like watch your breath, watch your feelings, as if from some distance, from some other planet, you know, watching the channel, the uh, channel that you're on on television or something. But in fact, we tend to use the words to sense, to feel, to be present for, not just to see, but to let ourselves feel the breath, the energies of the body, the feeling states that arise, again, as we've spoken about, 
the joy, the sorrow, the restlessness, the sleepiness, to be present for them, as Robert spoke about with the hindrances. You know, you think sleepiness isn't going to happen or it's not supposed to? In some Buddhist traditions, it's called the poor man's nirvana, right? It's respected. Oh, here comes sleepiness. Thank you. If you go in a Burmese monastery after lunch and you sit and there's all these monks in the hall, you think, God, they look so noble and dignified in their robes and their shaven heads and so forth. And after the sitting begins about 20 minutes in, about, you know, a quarter of them are doing this. And then when those monks stop doing it and sit up, then the other monks start to do it, you know, kind of gets passed around the room. It's just the energies that come through us, sometimes sad, sometimes joyful, sometimes awake, sometimes sleepy. And what we're asked is to know what we're feeling with our attention, to actually know it. From Simone Weil, who said, The danger is not that the soul should doubt whether there is any bread, but that by a lie it should persuade itself that it is not hungry. I'll read this again because there's something important in it. The danger is not that the soul should doubt whether there is any bread, but that by a lie it should persuade itself that it is not hungry. In this culture, what's called sometimes an addicted society or the society of speed and busyness and complexity and grasping and so forth, we lose touch with this dimension of feeling. We lose touch with our own vitality, our our heart's life. Someone came into an interview And they were struggling with how to work best with the breath or with certain body sensations very carefully and really thoughtfully wanting to do it. And then I noticed in their interview sheet that um, one of their parents had died. Their, Their last parent had died just recently. And I looked at this person, we were talking about the practices of breath and body and how to do it. And I just looked at them and I said, tell me about your father. And all of a sudden, all these tears started to come down and the heart softened. And It's like the goldsmith, knowing when to blow on the gold, when to sprinkle water on it, when to just attend to it with care. We're asked to be present for what's actually here, not to struggle to make something special happen, but to be present moment by moment for what actually is. There's a kind of reclaiming of our capacity to feel, our capacity to be open and alive from the heart out. Now, as we come into the breath and deepen 2% to 4%, it's okay. Maybe 5%, you're lucky. Six. Hmm. As we come into the body and can begin to feel the pleasures or the pain and give them space to float in our attention rather than contracting so much around them, feel what they want to do. As we come into the feelings, we also begin to see, it's been spoken about, the familiar patterns, mind states that come, grasping, if that's our style a lot, wanting or judging or comparing or resisting. The cartoonist Pfeiffer kind of captures the quintessential mind states that many of us have in these short little versions, like this cartoon which shows this man standing there looking in the mirror saying, I inherited my father's walk, 
my father's ideals, my father's creativity, my father's opinions, and my mother's contempt for my father. <laughs> like two sentences, there it is, a particular structure. And so we start to see these things. There's judging, there's self-criticism, there's comparing, there's grasping, there's resistance. And you can almost bow to them again. Thank you for your opinion. You know, it's just something that got tape recorded on there. You start to see what I call the top ten tunes, you know, the ones that come back over and over again, those themes, the storms that return. And the idea isn't so much to analyze them or figure them out or think about them, but actually to sense their energy. Oh, here's this one again and bow to it to meet them like the goldsmith with a, with a care, a warmth, a respectful attention. Simple. We're invited to stay present moment to moment. The breath, the body starts to open, feelings, thoughts. To stay present moment to moment as we walk, one step after another, and then different states arise and pass. To stay present moment, to moment as we eat. Pay attention, all this stuff comes and goes. And if we do, we start to sense what the Buddha described in the foundations of mindfulness of the contractions of the mind and body and the openings of the mind and body, that it breathes not just the physical breath, which we feel, the sensations, but the whole spirit and mind and consciousness itself experiences expansion and contraction. And if we feel that, and then these patterns start to come, we can listen a little bit more deeply to what is actually there. Like that man who came and was talking about breath and body, and then with a little attention to his father's death, all this other stuff started to come. Similarly, if there's patterns that arise again and again, we can start to sense the contraction that underlies them. Not just noting them by habit, but letting ourselves feel what's present and simply, like the goldsmith, giving it our careful attention. For example, I was sitting on a long retreat in the monastery um, many years ago, as a young man, doing my practice. And I had frequent and very um, strong bouts of sexual fantasy and lust. First of all, I was a young man trying to be celibate, right, in, in this monastery, and I was like 22 years old, which is not so natural to young men. It just isn't in the hormones. And then I would go out on my begging round with my bowl, being silent. And these beautiful, like angels, young girls from the village would come and make a bow at my feet and place a mango in my bowl. And I wasn't as interested in the mango, actually, as the <laughs> person who placed the mango in my... So I'd be sitting there, I'd go back and I'd be noting lust, lust, you know, desire, desire, and so forth didn't help a whole lot, actually. It just kept coming back over and over. That, that was one of the themes, one of the tunes. So I sat with it and paid attention. My teacher also gave me instruction, not just to name it lust, lust or desire, desire, but to feel the whole energy of it. And as I did, at some point, I became aware that it wasn't lust at all. It was loneliness. And then I would be sitting, following my breath and walking, minding my own business in this little tiny hut, way off in Thailand, and all of a sudden I'd feel lonely, not very mindful of it, I didn't even know it. And after I felt lonely, then all these fantasies of relationship and sex and all that stuff would come. But underneath that was this place of loneliness. So I shifted from feeling just the content of it 
to sensing more fully, oh, this is the suffering that keeps this coming. Loneliness, sense of abandonment. And we all have that at some times in our practice. As we sit and bring this this respectful attention, there are the stories, but in the heart deeper than that is love and unrequited love of different kinds and the grief that we carry, the sufferings we've been given to bear, the longings and beauty that we want to bring forth into this world. It's all there. Eric Fromm writes, I believe that every woman, every man represents humanity. We appear different as to intelligence or health or talents, yet we are all one. We are saints and sinners, adults and children, and no one is anyone's superior or judge. We have all been crucified with Christ and awakened with the Buddha. We have all walked with Gandhi, and we have killed and robbed with Genghis Khan and Stalin. And today, our life gives us a choice of which of these we will follow. We start to sense more deeply the energies of life that rise and fall within us, respectfully. I used to think that our task was somehow to get rid of greed and hatred and anger and delusion and that they were the problem and there was a kind of purification of getting rid of them. But as I've gone on over the years, I discover that underneath the grasping and need and greed, underneath the hatred and judgment, underneath the delusion and sleepiness, under all that usually is a kind of fundamental fear, what I've been calling the body of fear, that small sense of self that needs or resists, doesn't feel okay. And to be here is to begin to open the space that allows us to ask, who am I really? Am I that fearful one? Am I this small sense of self? Or is there some space within which all of that rises and passes? O nobly born, who are you really? You know, in the Greek language, the word for awakening is alethe. And it's opposite. The opposite of awakening in Greek is lethe. Lethe means to sleep, you know, the river lethe that will put you to sleep. So the opposite of awakening is not some kind of, you know, place of darkness or whatever you imagine. The opposite of awakening is being asleep, not being present. So here we are now, like the goldsmith, six days into the retreat, being present in a caring way for this breath as it comes, for these sensations of the body, for these feelings that arise and pass away. And as we do, we can begin to sense that things open in their own way. They know how to open. I sat with that loneliness for a long time after I noticed that that was what was going on. And I would name it gently, in mental note, lonely, lonely, loneliness. But as I noted it and paid attention, I felt that somehow in it there was also a struggle. Oh, I wish I weren't lonely. I wish somehow this could go away. There was a tremendous longing in it. And instead of judging that, I just let myself feel it more deeply as it came. And I felt that with that longing and loneliness in my body, there was this pulsing, hot, 
place that had it was like tears of sadness and 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 desire and as i felt it also that all the times that i'd felt abandoned or rejected or left out came and i began to hear the stories that came with that place they just came and the stories were a child's stories they usually are and they went something like There's a problem with you. There's something wrong with you. Otherwise, you wouldn't be rejected and left alone like this. There must be something wrong with you. And I let myself hear the story and feel the longing and the fire and pain and all of that. And as I let myself just be with it, it started to open or just rest or be and in the middle was a hole was this place underneath it all that was so empty that i'd been trying to fill up all the time all these different ways and that hole somehow had hunger and pain and wanting in it and i said all right let myself just feel this openness openly longing longing hunger hunger empty empty just giving it space very tenderly like the goldsmith again. And an interesting thing happened when I made space for it just to be. From feeling contracted and needy and fearful, it on its own began to soften and the vibrations became much finer and it started to expand and it filled more spacious and light and all the sense of need that I let myself feel began to open up into this this hole, began to open up into just a big sense of space. It was like a doorway into space itself. And from that sense of allowing its space, it just opened up as happens when we sit. And the space was peaceful and easy and whole. And in it, the whole idea that I was separate from anything else or that I should be lonely or rejected and so forth, it came and it made no sense because I was just this openness. I tell you this story with some reservation, the reservation being that it's not that you're supposed to try to go into everything in some analytic way. But rather, I wanted to speak about the sense of space that's in the middle of things and around things, and that as we pay attention, in the beginning we notice the experiences, the sensation of breath, this in-breath or that out-breath, the sensation of tingling or vibration, the feeling of sadness or loneliness, But as we settle down more, in addition to noting what's present, we can also begin to be aware of its process, how it changes and moves, and we do that by making space. Oh, what does the breath feel like? Oh, there's its beginning and middle and end. Here's the space around it. There's just sensations coming, and then it pauses, and then the next one comes. Or what is this sensation like? go in and feel the trembling and the tingling or the tension. And if we make space and let it open, maybe it gets more intense or less intense, but it actually moves and becomes alive and fluid in space. And so do our emotions and our thoughts. And the more we bring this caring and allowing attention, the more dynamic and alive experience becomes. This is from the Buddha. Suppose a man or woman who was not blind beheld the many bubbles on the Ganges as they floated along and watched them and carefully examined them. And after carefully examined them, they would appear empty, insubstantial. In exactly the same way does the practitioner pay attention to bodily phenomena, feelings, thoughts, perceptions, states of consciousness, as they arise and pass away. 
and examining them carefully, they appear as they are, empty, insubstantial, not graspable, not to be taken as oneself. So people have come into interviews, especially those who've been sitting longer. Someone came in and said, I'm doing my walking meditation now. I take a step. It's natural to move very slowly. And I've begun to notice that it's not the same foot that lifts off the ground and puts itself on the next step on the earth. That actually there are many, many feet. There's this foot and then it disappears in an instant and there's another foot and another one. And it's as if it's all arising and passing sensations in space and nothing is solid about it. That openness of attention and presence, what seemed to be a movement of the foot becomes so dynamic and open and changing and flowing. It's a river of sensations. Somebody else came in an interview and said, I was feeling the breath now, more settled on it, more present here. But then I began to realize as I felt the breath that the sense of my body disappeared, the boundaries of it. I could feel sensations, but I didn't know what was inside or outside. You know those moments that come? And the breath was just a flow of sensations like a breeze. And then all of a sudden I realized I was more aware of the space And the breeze just moved in space. Someone else spoke about how they were noticing the mental states and thoughts that would come and go. And began to realize how a thought would disappear and leave no trace. That, like the Buddha's words, bubbles are empty, the thought would be there And it would seem so real and vivid and you are this and they are that. And then it would disappear and be completely gone with no remainder, back into nothing. And they began to rest in space, this person, noticing the space around the breath the space around the sensations, the space in a room as they walked in here. There's all this space and then these, you know, human forms that move in the space, the space in the cup when you take tea. There comes a kind of awakening of insight as the meditation starts to deepen now. The idea isn't to have a particular experience. Instead, the insight into the true path comes when we discover that we're not trying to hold on to a single thing, not a perception, not a pleasant experience, not the calm of meditation. Those are all part of the waves of experience that rise and pass in space. And the idea isn't to... Hold your breath when you get something good and see how long you can get it to stay. It doesn't work very well. The idea is to let all of life breathe. And as we do, we let go moment by moment more fully. We learn to trust like the goldsmith, blowing on it sometimes, sprinkling water, softening, cooling it sometimes. And a lot of times just giving presence so that its beauty can start to show. You know, there's even a kind of spiritual clinging that comes. We start to open, let the breath breathe itself more. Sounds come and go. We sense space in the body and feelings. But then there can be a kind of spiritual holding that's important to notice. Because as we open become present. In the back, we still notice there are some stories we've heard about awakening, bliss, understanding, enlightenment, some amazing experience. You read about it, you know, the end of all my pain and conflict. And we think, well, this is nice what I have, but that, if I work and struggle, I'll get it. I'll undergo any agony. I'll even sit for two months here without moving, whatever it takes. 
but I must have it. I must have this. And then it begins to dawn on us that all the conflict and all the sorrow and all the suffering and all the frustration and lack that we experience is none other than, is exactly the same as our hopes, desires, demands, aspirations, imaginations that that very spiritual imagination becomes another clinging. What would it be like just to be? Just to be open to whatever presents itself. The mystery of things as they are. The suchness of things. We've looked, you know so far in so many places and so many forms for something special. Kabir writes, are you looking for me? I am in the next seat. My shoulder is against yours. To be with the mystery, the suchness of things, the Buddha is just present for life as it is. Within each of us, There is a silence, a silence as vast as the universe. We are afraid of it and we long for it. When we experience that silence, we remember who we are, creatures of the stars. And all that is created from the elements, created in time and space, arises from silence. To learn to be present is to discover this natural capacity to open, to release, to trust. It's a kind of trust of our innermost being, who we really are. And this trust has a great hospitality to it, a benevolence in it a joy in it. In the Buddhist text again, this wonderful invitation, O nobly born, you who are the sons and daughters of good families of the Buddha, remember the pure, clear light, the pure, white light from which everything in the universe comes to which everything in the universe returns the original nature of your own mind. Let go into this light, trust it, merge with it. It is home. When one seeks one's mind in its true state, when one turns to mind, because it seems like we're watching, we're paying attention, the breath, the body, the feelings, the thoughts, but who's watching? If we look and allow the space to be within which things arise and pass and turn to look at the mind. Say, who is this that's watching? When we seek our mind directly and turn toward it, although it is intelligible, it is invisible. And in its true state, the mind is naked, immaculate, not made of anything, transparent, vacuous, clear, containing all things, yet not limited by them, timeless. To know if this is so or not, look within your own mind. The eternal is not something that begins after you die, you know. (laughs) If there is an eternal and there is that which is timeless, it is here already and it has been here all along. The poet Rumi puts it this way. He says, 
Both the rose and the thorn appear together in spring. It's a lot of teaching in that line. Both the rose and the thorn appear together in spring. And the wine of the grape is not without its headaches. (laughs) Are you waiting for it to be different? Do not be an impatient bystander on this path. By God, there's no death worse than expectancy. Set your heart on gold. Let go of your ambitions and let your heart be clear like a mirror empty of forms embracing them all. Set your heart on gold. Hmm. I think about these retreats as serving two functions. In one way, they're a preparation for death. And I know this from the privilege of being at the bedside of those who've died over the years, breathing along with them, or sitting in the charnel grounds in the monastery and so forth. To sit with joy and sorrow with the pains and fears, to bow to it all, to come to know it in such a way as we do on this retreat, allows us to be with someone else when they're in great pain and say, it's okay. It allows us to be someone with someone else when they're in fear and say, I know that too, I've sat with that. And then in the end, of course, it teaches us to be with ourselves. But it's not just learning how to die. It's also learning how to live. Because it's only when we can be present like the goldsmith for the gold of this life to tend to it with care, to blow on it when it's time, to cool it gently with water when it's time, and to regard it with care and tenderness when it's time. To enter each moment with that tenderness and compassion. That's what it means to live fully. And you know what? It wants to open. Your innermost being longs to open. All it asks, this gold wants to shine. All it asks is our respect and our presence and our love. And it will naturally, it knows just how to do it. Just what it's doing as you sit and walk here is the right thing. I end with a passage from Ajahn Chah, my teacher. Try to be mindful and let things take their natural course. Then your mind and heart will become still in any surroundings, like a clear forest pool. All kinds of wonderful and rare animals will come to drink at the pool. You will see clearly the nature of all things. You will see many strange and wondrous things come and go, but you will be still. This is the happiness of the Buddha. Let's sit for a moment. Let the attention be spacious. Rest in the space, the pure, open space of awareness. And let the breath breathe itself and the sounds rise and fall like waves of the ocean. <laughs> 